is Valadani and I live here in Riondale, British Columbia. And I came here from England in 1947. And um, we came here on the, the uh, big Empress of Canada, docked on Pier 22 in Halifax, and came surging out with all the other people that were on that boat. And then my grandmother had traveled and was up here in Casala working in the hospital here and wrote my mother and father and said, why don't you come to Riondel? They're opening this area up, the mine's opening, and, and I'm sure Frank will get a job being a mechanic. So my father hitchhiked all the way from there to here and he came across on the Anscombe and then walked in on a dirt road, a cart road, to Riondel. He walked up the hill there and onto a cart road and it was getting dark and by the time he got to Riondel it was very dark and he saw these lights in the window and they were the Ozzlers and that house is now next to the one that's on Eastman um, where Sweeney's, well we say Sweeney's house but it was theirs and, uh, and he said where are Jack and Amy Russell and they told him where to go and he went down and then he was enfolded into their family and everybody was looked after. So we came then afterwards on a train from Vernon through the Rockies and, uh, and then we landed in Proctor and there was a big hotel there in Proctor and everybody had these rooms and there was a bit of a bar in the one end. Of course, we didn't go there, but we had a lovely time walking around with the dog in early Proctor and, the next, and that night we went off to bed and got up in the morning and the woman who ran it said to my brother and I and my mother, come into the kitchen with us. And we went in there and we helped her toast bread. And I'll never forget, it was the first pop-up toaster I've ever seen in my life. And we watched it pop up all the way. Anyway, um, we watched them coming in and stopping at just pulling up on a beach, this uh, the Moye would, and then they'd throw a gang, gang, gang plank down and people get off and, or people would get on it, or, and, and then luggage or freight was put on. And we watched that all the way up the lake to, uh, we went to Ainsworth and then we came into Riondale. Yeah. To Bluebell Bay. <laughs> and coming off the boat was, something that we I'd never done I was only five then and uh, and it was so exciting because coming from a big city was very it was a very depressing place it had bomb buildings everywhere and there were wires around it and I had just started school in Birmingham in the same school that my father went to and then all of a sudden coming on the dock getting off and being in Riondale all of a sudden was such a change it was like lightness you know and going down to the beach and being able to run along the beach and push out logs and 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 do skip you know skipping along and it was just so lovely and then we stayed in this little two-bedroom house and uh, it was like all the beds in one room and the living room kitchen uh, dining room in another room and we we're right beside Hendrix Creek <clears throat> And it was a lovely life. We used to spend, I must say, most of our life at the beach. <clears throat> the Russells had sort of taken us under their wings, and they were like the grandparents, though we didn't have. Well, when we got off and got settled, we met Mr. and Mrs. Russell. And Mr. Russell was a gentleman farmer, and he always wore a suit top and any, a flat hat. And his wife had uh, always... Uh, dresses on with aprons and some and her hair done up with a bandana. She had long hair and she'd braid it every day and put it around her ears, you know, or on the back of the neck, sort of her hair. But, uh, she, and then she put scarves over it because she didn't want it to get dirty because she ended up plucking chickens and uh, cleaning for all the milk, uh, for the milking of the cattle, cows and everything, and uh, which we bought milk from them. And so she ran a farm and the other people were dressed about the same way with dresses and, and aprons and uh, heavy stockings and uh, uh, sturdy shoes, very sturdy shoes. So, <laughs> except when we went 
to town after that, to, and town was Cowslow, we'd uh, get in our best clothes and we'd go off to Cowslow for the day. They'd drop us off. It was an hour's trip from Riondel to Caslow, and they'd drop us off and we'd walk up the hill there and we would, mom and dad would buy groceries and they'd go to the butcher store and they'd pick up anything they needed. And then it all came down by horse and, and, and uh, wagons down to the Moye when it came in again, because the Moye would drop us off at Caslow and then they'd go all around the lake and then come back to Caslow to pick us up. And, uh, and that's how we got our groceries. I remember leathery, lots of big leather chairs and, and, uh, and in the very back, a beautiful compartment in which you can actually see it's been redone up in Caslow if you go and visit the Moye. And so my first idea of this was quite different from the ship that I had been on. <laughs> and when there was lots of wood on the lake, we'd see wood and... Uh, planks and things like that coming over and through the uh, paddle wheel that uh, was pushing us along. It was, it was very interesting back there at the very back watching what was coming up. Yeah. When the Moye came in at uh, the fruit time with the Russells had large uh, farms uh, of apples and uh, cherries and plums and pears the Moye would bring in groups of these women that were dressed in very long dresses with scarves and spoke a different language. And later on, I found out they were Dukabors. So they used to come here and they'd stay in the picker's cabins because there was a few picker cabins around the uh, Russell farm, which used to be called the McGarvey farm, but the Russells took it over. And, uh, and they, you would hear them high up, or you'd hear them in the orchards talking and laughing in their own language. And our parents used to say, you're not allowed to go up there, they're working. So they would go and cook for themselves in the picker's places. And then they'd be up in the morning picking. And when they were finished, they would get on the boat because the boat would come Saturday mornings and Saturday afternoons. And some other, sometimes some other boats came in, but they would get back on the boat Saturday afternoon, and all the fruit would be loaded then too. There was Patterson's farm, and there was the Russell farm, and the Suckliffe farm, and they were all fruit ranching where they would pick all their fruit, put them in boxes, and send them out on the uh, uh, Moye. Now, when Kaminko started taking over, they bought the Russell farm, and they bought the Patterson farm, but they didn't buy the Suckliffe farm. So all those areas were then, um, what do you say, uh, surveyed and put into lots. And those big fields where you're going down um, hmm, to the boat dock and you see all those houses on each side, you could picture them without a house on them at all. And they're all big fields and they used to have some cattle there and some horses. And, uh, and then, of course, a break and, uh, and there'd be lots of trees there. That was in the spring, and in November that next year, that same year, my cousins came over uh, with their mother, who was my mother's sister, and uh, we saw them walking down the road, and they had the English uh, clothing on of pants to the knees, and then socks up and the shoes, and they had sweaters on. They didn't own jackets at that time. They were very cold, nobody did, they just had sweaters. Because in that time in England, it was very hard to get clothes. Well, Jack Russell um, and Amy moved here and they were related, uh, Jack was related to um, Mr. and Mrs. Beely. And he, Mr. Beely was the accountant for the uh, Fowler, the mine that went under Fowler before it went under and then Kaminko bought it. Um, so anyway, they came in after and they bought the McGarvey farm. And the Russells were very, very nice people. We had, their house was very homey. And uh, they would invite us in and we had things like Horlicks and hot chocolate and 
Ovaltine to drink, very Englishy things. And she always had cooking and things. So we'd always be eating their baking. And one time I went up there and there were chickens hanging upside down in the doorway. And obviously they would uh, kill them to eat them, but they also let them hang there for a while. So they got seasoned before they plucked them and cleaned them. And that was the English style in that time. Nowadays, you don't do that sort of thing. But back to Jack Russell, he then, because he knew my aunts and he, my aunt and he knew my grandmother, of course, we were part of their family. And Amy and Jack were just terrific and took us under their wing. My mother didn't know a thing about how to live in the bush. So Amy sure taught her how to can, they called it bottling at that time. And it was putting uh, fruit into bottles and, uh, and also how to put up fruit and vegetables. And then Jack helped my father put in his first garden and everything grew. My mother hated it. Every day we're out picking beans, <laughs> peas. But my father thought it was lovely because he'd never had anything like that in England. It was difficult to get fresh meat. Fresh f veggies were easy because we grew them all and canned them. Anyway, one day he came, Jack Russell came up to see us and said, can I talk to the children? And we thought, oh my God, what have we done now, you know? So we went there and he said, there's two apple trees across the road there and uh, they've got these big apples on them and they're about this big. And he said, they're not ready and they won't be ready till October. And you keep taking, somebody keeps picking them, taking a bite out of them and throwing them. He said, and it's a waste because these are the best apples. And I'll tell you what the name is, Wolf River. And he said, and then when they're ready in October, you pick them and you give them to your mother and you take out the center of the apple and you pack it with brown sugar or whatever it was that we did and you bake them. And honestly, they were the best apples I've ever, ever tasted, baked that way. So I went, now this is nowadays, I went to UBC Apple Festival and I was able to purchase a, a Wolf River apple. And it took seven years to develop. And this last spring, this last summer, I had seven big apples on this thing and I couldn't wait to get in the house and dig them out and stuff them all and, and they're a solid, beautiful apple. He was so right and I remembered them when I was young and they were very good. Anyway, he'd stand and talk to us, you know, in the, on the road or in the field and his wife, you could hear her yelling all the way and I'll tell you where their house was is now it's called a little green house and it's the end of Ainsworth Avenue and that's where the house was. So she would go out onto the porch and yell, Jack, Jack, come home. He'd say, oh, Amy calling and off he'd go. <laughs> but he would stand and talk to you all day. He was just that kind of a person. Yeah. Then he sold the place to Kaminko and right at that time, Amy came down with cancer. And so they both went to Vancouver to see how she was doing, but she never came back. So as the town started having children, there was then a need for school. So there was already a schoolhouse in, in Riondel. It was up where the coffee shop was. Actually, where that big pine tree is opposite Greens is where the school was. And they bought in a new school teacher named Mr. Matheson, and he had grade ones to 12 there. So that's where I first started going to school with Gail Suckliff and a few other people. And uh, my brother had to wait a year f before he went in there. And uh, Jim and, and uh, Bob Suckliffe were there. And the McGilveries were there and the Lynns were there and the Selbys. And it was quite an interesting school, but it was very difficult because uh, these new teachers didn't know how to teach from grade one, one to 12. <laughs> So we all knew about everybody else's stuff, but we didn't know very much about our stuff. <laughs> and it was quite f family ish then, and people would bring food and they'd all uh, eat, you know, very much like barn raising, but this was house raising. And so most of the houses were down on the flats, which we call the flats, which was when you drive down to the boat dock and you see all those houses were there. A lot of people 
We're also putting up tents and what they do is they put a, a solid floor, a solid walls and have a solid door and then they put over the tent over the top. And they even spent winters like that and they had a coal and wood stove and they'd be busy uh, pumping you know, wood into it and cooking on it and, and families would live that way. There were quite a few of those like that. And then the company would also go down to the beach and the payload, it was called a payloader, but it was a, just a big front end loader, would pick up all this wood that would come in in the spring from the uh, high water, high water, and they'd load it all and they'd dump it at people's place and it was up to them to cut those logs and then they'd burn those logs as fuel on the stoves. So the company was a very family oriented company and they're always uh, good people, um, family people that ran it. And if somebody wasn't family oriented and something went wrong, they were just asked to move on. And they had their own um, post office, which was, first of all, it was down at Bluebell Bay. And Dave Sutcliffe used to be the, uh, the postmaster. And he was a dithering man and spent ages uh, sorting mail, especially at Christmas. There were long lineups, people ready to get their parcels from uh, Eaton's or, or uh, um, Simpson Sears, you know, ready for that, because we all shop through catalogs or we'd get it in Caslow. And Christmas time was a very special time. We'd have um, uh, Christmas concerts, and they were through the school. And they were always, you know, at the school or at the uh, company um, cafeteria. And then uh, we were all dressed up, you know, like Mary and Joseph and all those things. And we didn't have uh, a church then. The church came in once a month and we'd go and have some sort of a church service in the school or something. And that was it for, for us until they built a church. And then the Catholics were first to build theirs and then we built our, the other, the other people built theirs, <laughs> a, a Panabode church, which is still in Riondo, yeah. <laughs> oh, Halloween was a great time because the company again would dump uh, leftover lumber and everything in the middle of the uh, ballpark and uh, they'd build, have a huge big bonfire and everybody went down to the bonfire all dressed up. What was really fun is our parents would dress up all the time. And I remember seeing this nurse walking around this fire and it was my father dressed up in our friend's nurse's outfit. <laughs> and he had a hat, on, <laughs> a nurse's hat on his head and his dress and uh, this cloak, you know, how nurses wore capes. And everybody was dressed up and we all would, like a group of us girls would get together and one day we, one time we dressed up as Campbell Soups and another time we made this structure and it was supposed to be a whale and someone was inside squirting some water inside when we went th <laughs> through, you know, around the fire. And, uh, and then the community, then we break off and then the kids went around trick-or-treating and it was always who's got the candy apples? Because we'd always hit there first. <laughs> it was great.